but thank you very much for joining us. Um, I just wanted to flag up that if you attended the first talk I delivered right at the start of the month, um, then I would have already given you a sort of brief overview of some of the birds to look out for. Um, and this session might just helpfully uh, build on that and give you a bit more depth in the guide to what, um, what to look for when you're wondering what you're looking at. But if you didn't see that talk, doesn't matter. Um, you are more than welcome to, well, obviously you're more than welcome to stay, um, but also this will help you don't need to see them. They're not mutually exclusive. You can do one or the other. So uh, the first thing I wanted to do was give you a little overview of some of the birds that we would be looking at during this session. So Morecambe Bay is home to uh, around 210,000 coastal birds during the autumn, winter and spring. Um, and this number is made up of a lot of different species. So there's about 27 different species of wader um, and about 29 species of wildfowl. And though I would be more than happy to give you all a, probably a week long talk about all the differences between all the species in Morecambe Bay, um, I don't think we really have time for that. Um, and to be honest with you, some of the rarer ones, I would have a little bit of trouble telling apart as well. So for this talk, I'm just going to give you a brief introduction to some of the most frequently seen uh, waders and wildfowl around Morecambe Bay. So I've mentioned the words waders and wildfowl quite a few times already. Um, so I thought it might be helpful to explain uh, just a little bit uh, what these words mean. So birds are an incredibly diverse group and often you uh, get all the different species of birds put together in different groups. And this is based just on how they look, where they're found and what they do. So waders and wildfowl are just two of these different groups of uh, birds. So we'll do waders first. Um, waders form a large part of the birds um, that spend their time on the shore. Um, and they often have uh, long legs or long beaks, as you can see from these pictures. Um, sometimes they just have a long beak and sometimes they just have long legs, but a lot of the time they have both. And unsurprisingly from the name wader, you'll often find them wading through the mud or the shallow water in estuaries, uh, salt marshes and mud flats um, on the hunt for food that is buried uh, underneath the surface of the mud. So these are some of the waders that we find commonly around Morecambe Bay. Um, you can see they do all look a little bit different from each other, uh, but they do have the same shape. The other characteristics of waders is that they are highly migratory often. Um, so the, bar, the bar-tailed godwit, which is this one here, um, actually holds the record for the longest migration of any animal in the world. Um, one individual was recorded flying from Alaska to New Zealand, uh, which is well over 7,000 miles in about eight days and didn't even stop once uh, to have a break. So really incredible birds. Uh, the other thing about waders that you often see is that they do change their plumage. So their summer plumage is often bright and colourful and their winter plumage is a little bit more drab and dull. So whilst this does make things a little bit difficult uh, from a ID perspective, fortunately for us, uh, we only get most of these birds during the winter months. So we always get them at their, their drabbest and the dullest. So that's just an introduction to waders and these are the 12 that we'll be looking at. So we have, in no particular order, uh, lapwing, turnstone, sandling, curlew, bar-tailed godwit, grey plover, the knot, uh, red shank, oyster catcher, black-tailed godwit, ring plover, and dunlin here at the end. So it's not just waders that make up the species of birds on Morecambe Bay. Uh, we also get uh, wildfowl. And wildfowl are basically ducks and geese. Unlike the waders, they have webbed feet, so they are often seen swimming rather than wading. Um, and they also have, most of the time, this broad, blunt beak, which they use to feed on suspended food particles, such as seeds, grasses, small fish, amphibians, if they're lucky. Um, and they use uh, a special type of protein in their beak called pectin uh, to sieve it out of the water. So we have many types of uh, wildfowl around Morecambe Bay. Um, and unlike the waders, they, uh, we see them at their best. Uh, so they are really, some of them are really quite beautiful and colourful and very varied. So I hope I'll introduce you to these six ones. So we have uh, grey leg goose, brent goose, shell duck, ida, uh, teal and widgeon. So getting on to the ID side of things. 
Uh, when we talk about ID of any type of bird, um, but especially wading birds, it's a bit like being a detective. There isn't always one definitive trait that identifies wading bird species. And if there is, you might not always be able to see it. And this is because of various factors, such as cold weather, bad lighting, wobbly lenses, all sorts of things can make it difficult to tell what you're looking at. So for example, uh, if you think of an oyster catcher, if we just go back to this. Whoop. So this oyster catcher here has the um, really long uh, orange beak, which is unique amongst uh, all of the birds in the UK. But what if, you, uh, what if it was a cold day and it had its beak tucked under its wing? it doesn't really look that much different from a lapwing or a turnstone. So you've got to look at other things that can give you a clue uh, to what you're looking at. So a good place to start when we're talking about bird ID um, is with size. So here I've made this uh, little parade of all the different wading birds and ducks uh, to show you how they vary in size. So Obviously, there's not a lot of point in me telling you exactly how many centimetres tall an oyster catcher is because chances are you're not going to be that close to it. I would hope not. Um, but what we're talking about is relative size. So how big they are um, in comparison to each other. So for the wading birds here at the front, we have a curlew, which is the biggest wading bird in the UK. Um, and then right at the other end, uh, you've got the tiny um, ringed plover. So most of the time, they aren't stood in uh, lovely little uh, size ordered parades like this. Uh, so it's sometimes much more helpful to uh, divide them up into size categories. So for the waders, uh, we have the three larger ones, uh, the curly, the oyster catcher and the black tailed godwit. For medium, we have bar tailed godwit, lapwing, redshank, knot and turnstone. Uh, and also grey plover, however, I clearly missed that picture off this, uh, this slide. Um, and then in the small section, you've got Sandling, Dunlin and Ring Plover. So it's not always too easy to tell which is which when you're out in the marsh, but one trick to tell which size category something belongs into is to imagine them running underneath each other's legs. So for example, a bird in the small category would be able to fit through the legs of a bird in the large category, but not in the medium. And a medium uh, sized bird would not be able to fit through the legs of a large sized bird. So for example, the sandling, which you can see here, would easily be able to fit between the legs of a, an oyster catcher or a curlew, but not between the legs of a red shank, and certainly not between the legs of a turnstone. So uh, just for your reference as well, I'll keep the birds in size order throughout the rest of the, sl the slides uh, so you can get an idea of this. But size is a really good way to tell the difference between the waders. Uh, when it comes to uh, wildfowl, geese and ducks, uh, it's not always as easy to use the rule about running in between each other's legs because a lot of the time they're on the water swimming. They're not always uh, out, and, out and about walking. But I think for ducks, it's much more helpful to compare them to something we all recognise. Uh, so you should be able to ID this duck, hopefully, uh, the mallard. Um, Mallards are medium-sized, uh, so and they're quite often around as well when you see some of these other ducks. So it's a good uh, sort of scale for you to look at when you're trying to work out which duck is which. So on the large side, you've got grey leg geese, um, which are very large, uh, much bigger than a mallard, and also the shell ducks, which are larger, uh, sort of both in size but also much taller. They're really more like a goose than a duck, a shell duck. And then the medium category, you've got an eider duck and a brent goose. Uh, Brent geese are the smallest type of goose in the UK um, and both an ida and a Brent goose are roughly about the size of a mallard. Then down on the small scale you've got widgeon and teal. So teal are absolutely tiny ducks, they're barely half the size of a mallard um, and they're very cute little ducks if you see them but if you see a tiny duck chances are it's probably a teal. So size is one clue we can look for. Uh, but next on our list is the shape and plumage. So when we look at the plumage of the waders, um, you can see that though they are a bit different, they don't always have characteristics that stand out. But if you look at them all side by side, you can see that one characteristic that a lot of them has is that they are pale on the belly and dark on the top. 
This is called counter shading and it can be seen in pretty much all birds all around the world, um, as well as with most other animals, uh, from frogs to fish to mammals. This counter shading helps to disrupt an animal's profile against a background and provides camouflage for both hunting and also for escaping from predators. So from these pictures, we can see that some birds have slightly bolder counter shading than other ones, which are much more drab and uniform. So for this course, I've decided to uh, divide them into ones with uh, bright uh, contrasting counter shading and the ones which don't have such bold colors. So hopefully this will make sense in a moment. So here we go, the ones with the bright and bold uh, coloring. Uh, when it comes to brightness and boldness, uh, oyster catchers are definitely the star of the show. They have their long orange beak, which is unique amongst other waders, and also these bright pink legs. On top of this, they've got really strong stark patterning uh, of the white belly and the dark head, neck and wing feathers. Lapwing have, um, also have strong bold counter shading, uh, but they also have, uh, instead of a black feathers, they have sort of petrol green feathers. They can look dark in bad lighting, uh, black in sort of poor lighting, but they, um, when the sun hits them, it's this beautiful sort of petrol mix of green, purple, and um, sort of red, all the colors. Lapwing also have this distinguishing feature. Uh, they have a crest at the top of their head, uh, they're the only wader that have one of those in the UK. Um, so it's an excellent identifying feature. It looks a bit like a radio antenna. Um, so if you see something with a crest like that, it's probably a lapwing. Turnstones have, um, again, really strong counter shadering. Um, they're a lot smaller than oyster catcher, but they can look similar if you not have them side by side. But the thing to look for is orange legs rather than pink legs. And also they've got a very short, dark bill. They also have a B-shaped bib when you look at them front ways, um, which can be a good way to indicate that it's a turnstone you're looking at. Finally, the ring plover, um, much smaller than the other ones. Um, and the counter shading is not that clear, but it does have a, a darker top and a lighter belly. Um, and it has this beautiful sort of beige color on its back. It's also got a short beak, uh, orange with a black tip and this fantastic uh, ringed markings from which it gets its name. I think it's like, um, it's, like it's wearing a little bandit mask uh, with the sort of white forehead. The other thing about the ring plovers and the lapwings is that they are both part of the plover family. And the key characteristics of plovers is that they have dark, large dark eyes. You can't quite make it out for this picture um, and short beaks. So if you see something with that sort of shape again, then you're probably looking at one of the plovers that we have here. So moving on to the ones with the slightly less bold plumage, um, the curlews, the godwits, the red shanks, and the grey plovers. So curlew, um, the shape of it is really obvious to identify. They're the only one with this incredibly long downward curving beak, um, and they're also the largest wader by far. Their plumage is sort of mottled brown and white. Um, up close when the sun shines on it, it's a really fantastic patterning. But on a, on a cloudy day, it can look quite uh, sort of drab and dull. But as I say, long curved beak is definitely a curly. Next, we have the godwits. And godwits are really tough to tell the difference between. Um, people who are experts at bird watching can't always tell the difference between the godwits. So there's just a couple of things that you need to look for. In flight, that's the easiest time to tell uh, which godwit is which. So uh, obviously from the names, you can look at the tail. Black-tailed godwits have these uh, black tail feathers, solid black, um, whereas a bar-tailed godwit has uh, striped tail feathers, um, as you could guess from the name, so barred or striped. The other thing when they're flying as well, if you can't always see the tail, um, is that they've got black-tailed godwits have this white wing bar, which uh, bar-tailed godwits don't have. So that's a couple of things you can look for. Sometimes, if you've got a good view of them, you can see that a bar-tailed godwit has a slightly upturned beak, um, whereas a black-tailed godwit has a completely straight beak. But as I say, you've got to be at the right angle uh, and you've got to have a good view. 
The best way that I tell to remember the difference between a bar-tailed godwit and a black-tailed godwit is by looking at their legs. Black-tailed godwits have much longer legs than bar-tailed godwits. And if you see them stood up, like in this picture, you look at the top section of the leg to see which is longer. I imagine writing the word bar or black on the top section of their legs. So here you can see with the black tail, with the bar tail gobwit, it's quite short. So you can only fit the word bar on it. Whereas with the black tail gobwit, you'd be able to fit black on it. They've got much longer um, sort of top leg segments, but they are very tricky. Uh, the red shank is next. This is a much easier one to identify. As the name suggests, they've got these bright orange legs, uh, which are unique amongst the waders. Uh, so if you see something with legs this colour, it's probably a red shank. However, I will warn you that a red shank that's been feeding in a muddy uh, salt marsh might have a sort of different shade of brown on the legs while they wade through all the dirt and the mud. They also have a sort of relatively long beak with an orange uh, base. Again, unique amongst the waders, but it's not too different from a, a bar-tailed godwit's beak, so just be careful. Uh, and finally, for the waders, the grey plover. Um, as I said, like the ring plover and the lapwing, it's got this short black beak and big eyes which help it to hunt. And then for the smaller waders with the shorter legs, uh, again, it can be difficult to tell the difference if you've got bad light, but there are a few things you can look for. Knots are really difficult, but the main thing to look for with knots is they've got this broad eye stripe. Um, other than that, they're pretty nondescript. So if you can't figure out what it is, it's probably a knot. Um, they can be tricky to tell. But although they're very dull looking uh, with their plumage, uh, when they sort of get up and fly around to escape predators, they have the most fantastic uh, murmurations that sort of shimmer um, in the light. So um, dull looking sometimes, but when they're, in, like, when they're on their own, but when they're together, they can be really, really fantastic. Sandling, um, again, not too much going on with their plumage, but they are much whiter than any other type of wader. Uh, so if you see them amongst a roost, you can really tell. They look like little white golf balls uh, running around on the shore, much paler than anything else. And then a dunlin, as the name suggests, uh, dunlin meaning small brown thing. They are small brown things. Uh, they have a slightly down curved beak um, and dull brown wings, but they can be difficult to identify. They do have a much paler belly than um, the knot, so that can be one way to tell them apart. But as I say, it can be tricky. Moving on to the ducks, you'll be glad to hear that they're much uh, more colourful um, and easy to identify. So here we have the shell duck, which is a really beautiful uh, type of duck. Uh, they have this bright red beak, which is uh, a good identifying characteristic. You don't see that in any other sort of ducks. Um, and then they have a sort of dark head and though it looks black, again, like the lapwing, it's actually sort of petrol green in the sunlight. And then this beautiful sort of patchwork plumage of white, uh, black and chestnut. And you often see them sort of wandering around on the sandbanks and when they do, they've got bright pink legs, uh, similar to a nice catcher. The eider duck is, uh, Another quite colourful, uh, brightly patterned duck. They've got this black and white plumage um, and this black cap on top of the head. And at the bottom of the nape of the neck, they've got this interesting sort of pistachio green, uh, sort of, I don't know what you'd call it, patch. <laughs> um, but with eider ducks as well, it's good to look at the shape of their head because they have this uh, sort of much more streamlined head than any of the other ducks. And that's because they're diving ducks. They need to be much more streamlined to get to the seabed to catch the prey that they're searching for. Widgeon um, have a brick red head and also have this golden stripe down the front of their forehead, which is a great diagnostic feature for them. They have this red blush on their breast um, and then other than that, just a, a lovely grey black uh, with a black tail. Finally, uh, for the brightly coloured ducks, uh, we've got the teal, the tiny teal. And they have a brick red head, but they've got this sort of glam rock uh, green stripe going on over the eye. Um, and again, green plume, uh, grey plumage, but also this uh, lovely yellow tail at the back. What I will say about the ducks is that um, though the males can be very colourful, like these ones, um, the females are a lot more drab and camouflaged. 
So if you can only see a female duck, then it's much more reliable to look at its size in order to identify them rather than the colours. So finally, for the plumage side of things, um, we're the grey lag goose. I'm sure many of you have come across a grey lag goose. Um, they're not the most even tempered of, uh, of birds, uh, but they're quite commonly seen and easy to identify. They've got this orange beak, uh, pink, orange legs, and just sort of uniform grey plumage with a, a white tail. And the Brent Goose. Uh, Brent Geese, they are named uh, because of their colouring. So Brent is Norse for burnt. Uh, they thought they looked like uh, a burnt goose because of their sort of charcoal grey head, neck and back. Um, they've got a white belly and uh, white tail feathers. And they've also got this white necklace um, in, around the neck. Now, not all Brent Geese have this white marking around their neck. Um, it is only the adults. So the first year juveniles have a completely black neck. So you can always tell the, the, new, um, the new geese in the family when they arrive on our shores in the winter time. So that's physical clues. Hopefully it's making sense so far and you're managing to keep up. Uh, but as I say, even though size, uh, shape and colouring um, seems like the easiest way to tell birds apart, it's not always the easiest way. Um, with the reflections or the sun making um, colours and shapes look strange. So another good way to tell birds apart, um, which is um, a little bit harder to show when we're not down on the shore watching them, is their behaviour. So waders and wildfowl uh, through the winter have to spend most of their time feeding. Um, so feeding behaviour is something that we see them doing an awful lot. Most of the time when they're not sleeping, they'll be feeding. And each bird has a different approach to getting enough to eat from the shores of the bay. And not only does this make identifying them a little bit easier, but it also means that they're exploiting slightly different prey in the same place. So they're not competing with each other on the marsh. And what this means is that you get lots of different species uh, living on the same patch of marsh and feeding and all living in harmony together. So let's have a look at some of the feeding behaviours. I've split the, the behaviours into four categories. Uh, probing or pecking around in the mud. Uh, sorry, probing or poking around in the mud. Uh, pecking or just picking stuff up off the surface. Hammering or prizing or swimming. Oh or swimming or dabbling. So you can often tell what sort of feeding behaviour a bird's going to have uh, by the shape of its beak. The ones that probe tend to have longer beaks and the ones that peck tend to have shorter tweezer-like beaks. Uh, the hammer and prizing ones is only one type of bird but they've got incredibly specialised beaks um, and the dabbling um, or swimming ones are often ducks and they have, as I said earlier, the specialised pecked in um, on the edge of their beaks to sieve out the water. So the probers are um, the curlew, the godwits, the redshank and the dunlin. So curlews uh, use this long beak to, as you can imagine, uh, dig really deep into the prey, into the surface of the mud and pull out the prey. And they can also use the curve of their bill to reach under rocks and catch any unsuspecting crabs that think that they're safe, uh, safe from the birds. They can use the, um, the curved beak to get underneath and get those guys out. The godwits have uh, a really fast feeding style. The black-tailed godwits with their longer legs tip really far forward and they almost look like they're upside down uh, when they're feeding. But they're sort of really busy, really hungrily, look like they're really gobbling um, all the shellfish and worms that they're pulling out of the, um, pulling out of the mud. Bar-tailed godwit again, very similar, but because they've got sh slightly shorter legs, they'll be feeding a bit less upside down looking than the black-tailed godwit. So that's another way you can roughly tell between the two of them. Uh, red shanks uh, do mostly pro, but they do do a little bit of everything. Um, they wade really deep and will occasionally swim, which is rare for waders. Um, and they'll be eating these really small snails that live in the mud called hydrobia. And they've got to eat hundreds and hundreds of them um, every day in order to survive. And your dunlin are more like little sewing machines. So similar to the 
godwits, they'll be feeding really fast, doing lots of digging around. Um, but because they're so small, they literally look like little sewing machines wandering, uh, wandering along and having a feed. So I've just got a little clip for you of uh, an example of probing behaviour. Um, it's some godwits. I don't know if anyone wants to put in the chat, try and guess which type of godwit it is. But you can see that they're doing this really busy, really fast probing and digging around. So those are black tail godwits. You can see by the length of their legs uh, that they're quite tall. Um, so black tail godwits, those ones. So with the pecking behaviour, these are those birds with the sort of more pincer, um, tweezer-like bills. Uh, we've got the knot, the turnstone and the sandling. So between these, there's not much difference, but there is some small differences in the behaviour. So knot tend to keep their head down. They're just picking things up off the surface and they'll not look up at all when they're feeding, just sort of make their way around, pecking away anything, any small shellfish or snails that they find on the surface or just below the surface. Turnstones, as the name suggests, literally turn over the stones when they look for food um, and they'll literally bulldoze the seaweed and flotsam them out of the way uh, to try and find uh, little sand hoppers or other invertebrates that are hiding underneath. Turnstone are quite interesting as well because they are generalist feeders. They'll eat just about anything, uh, whether it's chips off the seafront or an abandoned seal placenta during the seal breeding season. Um, and they've also been recorded eating human flesh. Uh, when a body washed up on a beach, uh, the, the turnstones saw it as a great opportunity uh, to get a bit of extra food. Sandlings, um, again, have a slightly different uh, behavior. So they sort of peck the water as they run in and out with the waves. Um, so they look like they're little clockwork toys chasing the tide. Um, and they're after little crabs, shrimps, and sand hoppers. And these smaller birds are really uh, picking up microscopic um, invertebrates that we can't even see with our eyes. So you can imagine just how many of those they have to eat in order to get a good meal. So this is an example of the sandlings feeding. And you can see they're not really digging around. I think they're all sort of squabbling over a shellfish that's been left there. Um, but they're just roughly just picking up stuff off the surface. Uh, the stop-start feeding behaviour is a characteristic of uh, the plovers. So all three of the lapwing, the grey plover and the ring plover um, do this sort of behaviour. They use their large eyes to spot prey um, or evidence of prey on the surface of the mud um, and then will suddenly dart forward to retrieve it out of the mud. So I've got an example of this here. This is a grey plover. So standing very still and then suddenly darting forward when it thinks it sees something. So as I say, all plovers have this feeding style and it's very sort of methodical. And finally for the waders, we have um, the feeding behavior, the hammer L prize technique. So oyster catchers develop one of three bill shapes. Um, the first is the hammer, and they use this to smash uh, and get the food out of them. Some of them have sort of wedge-shaped bills, which they use to prise open the shellfish, so opening them carefully rather than smashing them apart. And then other ones have more pointy bills, which they use to dig for worms. And it's really interesting because it seems that um, the the bill shape is controlled rather than by genetics, but is by their behaviour. Um, so um, an oyster catcher's bill grows um, about not point fingernails. So what this means is that the growth of the, the bill means that they can change the shape of the bill very rapidly if the feeding style was changed. And a study showed that when uh, captive oyster catcher's food choices were changed uh, from, from lugworms to um, mussels, uh, their bill shapes changed uh, from hammer, from chisel shaped beaks to tweezer like beaks in just 10 days. So absolutely fascinating. Uh, the wildfowl basically all have uh, duck-like dabbling behaviours. Uh, many ducks and geese, as I said before, have pecked in along the edge all the, um, the little things that they eat out of the water. So this could be bits of pondweed or grass, uh, small seeds and vegetation, um, or 
small insects or um, amphibians that they find in the water. Eider ducks are the only one which are slightly different. They eat mussels and shellfish. And they can do this because they have extremely muscular throats uh, with which they can crush the shells of the mussels and cockles and they'll excrete, excrete the shells as sand. So they're, and they also dive for their food as well. So as I say, that's why they've got this distinctive head shape, but pretty much everything else um, will eat, use the sibling technique to get the food out of the water. So that is feeding behavior. But the other thing you can do as well as, well as your eyes to um, identify birds is by using your ears. Now this doesn't go for all species of wader. A lot of them just have um, quite um, high pitch, difficult to identify um, calls. But there are a few which are a little bit different and a bit more distinctive. So I'm just gonna play a couple of them now for you. So probably the most well-known call out of all the waders is the curlew they have this really distinctive bubbling call and it almost sounds like it, they're saying their name. I'm not going to do the sounds for you, don't worry, I'm just going to play them for you. So that's the curlew. Hopefully it sounds a little bit like the word curlew, but not everyone agrees. Uh, oyster catchers have a very loud, high-pitched, repetitive note. I think it sounds like a squeaky dog toy, um, and they are incredibly vocal birds. Um, if you get too close to an oyster catcher, um, or if another oyster, gets, oyster catcher gets too close to another oyster catcher, they're definitely going to tell you. So let's have a listen. Very noisy, very squeaky. The red shank um, has a sort of ringing call. They call the red shank the warden of the marsh because it's the first one to react with dan to danger with a loud ringing call. And this alerts all the other birds on the salt marsh that there's disturbance around. The lapwing has, uh, again, a loud, shrill call, um, and this is another one which um, reflects its common name. So another name for a lapwing is a peewit, um, and many common names for lapwing in other languages also reflect its name. So it's got quite a distinctive call. I think it also sounds a little bit like one of those uh, slidey whistles as well. Uh, onto the ducks. Uh, the eider duck has an absolutely fantastic call. Uh, it sounds like it's just heard some really great gossip. So there we go. That's the male eider duck. And the widgeon also has uh, an interesting sort of woo sound uh, when it hits the water. Um, so yeah, so that's it for bird sounds. It's such a shame that everyone thinks that ducks only go quack, only mallards go quack. Um, ducks make a fantastic array of sounds. So moving on from the behaviour, the behavioural clues to bird ID, um, and let's look at not just looking at the bird, but looking at um, what time of year it is and what else is around. So the majority of birds we have in Morecambe Bay uh, sadly only stay with us uh, for the winter months. And come spring, they'll migrate north to their breeding habitats high up on the Arctic tundra. 
Um, as I said before, the migrations made by these birds are truly incredible. Uh, something as small as a turnstone, which isn't much bigger than a blackbird, uh, will travel all the way from eastern Canada uh, to Morecambe Bay to spend the winter here, and then it'll be flying all the way back in the, in the spring. And the reason that they make these migrations is because they want to breed in the northern and the northern Arctic um, to make the most of the almost 24 hour daylight. This allows them to spend the maximum amount of time feeding and spend the minimum amount of time um, acting as prey for nocturnal predators who would happily plunder the nests of eggs, chicks or even take an unsuspecting adult bird under the cover of darkness. But they don't have much time to do this. Um, the breeding season is short and as soon as the days start getting shorter and the weather turns colder, the Arctic's no place for a bird. So they take off along with their newly fledged young and make for the rich feeding grounds and comparatively warm temperatures of Morecambe Bay, where they can feed and fatten up and do it all again the next year. So these are the birds that we have for the winter only. Uh, both of the godwits generally only have hair in the winter the turnstones, sandling, uh, the dunlin, the knot, the brink geese, the teal, uh, the grey plover and the widgeon. And they might be over in Alaska way like the turnstones, uh, up in Greenland like the knots, or even over the other side in Siberia uh, like the sandlings. So they're all over the place in the um, Arctic Circle. But we do have some of the birds staying with us year round, uh, so it's not saying goodbye to all of them every year. Um, and although some of the species on these, this slide will head off to the northern breeding grounds, some of them will also stay around. So it's possible to see these all year round in Morecambe Bay. Ring plovers over here, red shank, and some of the oyster catchers will stay around Morecambe Bay all year round, staying on the shore. And they have highly camouflaged nests on shingle beaches or hidden in the marshes. Eider ducks, build cosy hidden nests lined with eider down to hatch their young and in the summer you'll see large groups of female eiders looking after an even larger crash of eider ducklings. Shell ducks prefer to move underground uh, to raise their young and will make use of abandoned rabbit warrens. Some birds uh, don't stick around the coast uh, like lapwing and curlew and they'll move inland and make nests on farmland feeding on worms and insects through the summer. Out of all these birds, the oyster catchers seem to be the most adaptable. They sometimes nest on the shore, but also move inland and nest on farmland. But more interestingly, they also like to nest in car parks, uh, school roofs, and also flower pots in people's gardens. So they're adapting to a more urban lifestyle. And it's not clear whether the movement of oyster catchers into the cities is more positive or negative for breeding success. Uh, since both wild and urban nesting sites have slightly different positive and negative uh, pressures on them. Um, but that is something that's being under study at the moment. So hopefully that's given you a bit of a quick overview of how to, where to start when you're IDing the birds of the bay. I just want to highlight that although this gives you an overview of ways to tell them apart, it's not always an exact science. As I say, lighting, weather and distance from what you're looking at can make things difficult, but also the birds themselves don't look exactly as you're expecting them to. In autumn and spring, they may still have the summer plumage on, like this uh, knot, um, and look a bit more bright and colourful. And also this turnstone um, is also in its summer plumage, but this was spotted in the middle of December. So clearly this turnstone decided to hold on to its breeding plumage just a little bit longer uh, to test everyone's ID skills. And then you also get genetic variations uh, such as albinism and leucicism. Uh, so this is a leucistic oyster catcher, which you can see is clearly lacking a lot of plumage, uh, pigment from its plumage um, and doesn't look exactly how you're expecting it to, like it should look like these ones in the foreground. But the main thing is the more you get out and look at the birds and get used to them, the better you'll be at IDing them. So the last thing I wanted to say before it's time for questions is that the birds of the bay, no matter which ones we're talking about, are very, very special. 
We're incredibly fortunate to welcome 210,000 waders and waterfowl to Morecambe Bay. And this includes five of the eight red listed wading bird species. So you can see it's essential that Morecambe Bay continues to be a stronghold for waders and waterfowl. Um, and there are a few ways that you can all help protect, um, protect the birds of the bay. The first one is to keep dogs on leads in coastal areas. Uh, so for birds, keeping energy high is essential in order for them to survive the winter. Um, and because dogs love to run and chase, it means that they can get chased away from where they're feeding. And when this happens, they lose about 12 times more energy um, than they would if they were just resting and not afraid of dogs that were coming. The next one is keep to the paths and follow advice on the signs. Um, feeding or roosting birds um, can become habituated to low level movement or sound and they know that people and dogs on paths are not a threat so they won't move away as soon. However, as soon as you leave the path the birds are likely to become more stressed and take flight when approached. It's all about keeping those energy levels high. Listen out for alarm calls. We heard a few of the alarm of the calls of the birds of the bay there, um, but when they're distressed, they often sound loud and angry sounding. And this is a good warning that you're getting a little bit too close to comfort. And you should think about moving further up the shore if you can hear them sounding distressed. You can support nature reserves where habitat is managed to encourage overwintering and migratory waders. And by protecting these places, we're increasing the chances of the population increasing and stopping the decline of the more vulnerable species. And finally, the easiest way to protect the birds of the bay is to just keep talking about them. If people know that they're there, people are more likely to care for them and protect them. Um, so be sure to tell your friends all about the birds of the bay and why not show off uh, some of your new ID skills as well. So if you'd like to more, learn more about the birds of the bay, you can visit our website um, where you'll find our fantastic birds of the bay leaflet, uh, which has a little ID guide inside it. And you can also visit our ID page. So here we have uh, some more information on each one of the wading bird species. Um, but you can also get in touch with us and ask us any birdie questions you might have. Um, and hopefully we'll be able to answer them or point you in the direction of someone who can. So I hope you enjoyed the talk. Um, if you've got any questions, please uh, share them in the chat or give us a shout. I'll take everyone off mute. Or if you unmute yourself, if you've got a question on them. Thank you, Amy. That was that was brilliant. Um, I've just been looking at uh, some of the questions coming in. We, so we do have loads of questions, but um, I think quite a typical one is one that just came through, which is I think particularly the stuff around the bird behaviour as an ID tool mm -hmm. is really, really helpful. And that's the sort of thing that you just don't get when you're looking at a bird book or you're in a bird hide. Um, so yeah some bit of love coming in for that section in particular but I'm going to go to the chat now um, and I will try and group them as much as I can um, but we'll we'll see how we get on. Um, loads and loads of questions actually I've chaired a few of these I don't think we've had quite as many questions by this stage before um, so where should we start? Um, right yeah so the first question that came in um, is around do we get two types of oyster catcher uh, now I don't think we do but I wonder if you maybe answered that question in a slightly different way with your um, your answer about the different beaks and the way that they're they're very very adaptable yeah so, so it's just we only get one sort of oyster catcher um, in the UK it's the Eurasian oyster catcher um, but each um, individual oyster catcher will have a different shaped beak and it's basically whatever food's available, its beak will change shape um, in order to suit its feeding techniques. So an individual bird, if it's feeding on mainly on worms, it'll have a sort of pointy beak for digging them out of the sand or the mud. Um, but if that food source changes for whatever reason, it has to start eating mussels, its beak shape might change and adapt to that change um, by becoming more hammer shaped or more chisel shaped so it can prize them open. Mm -hmm. We actually managed um, to scavenge the skull of an oyster catcher that we found down at Jenny Brown's Point in Silverdale. Okay. And, and I was really disappointed because I was expecting the red beak to stay. <laughs> and of course, the red beak is almost like a, 
I mean, you likened it to fingernails, didn't you? It's, it's, um, it just kind of faded and rotted away and fell off. So I can really see how that kind of outer shell of the beak can, can adapt and change shape because of its substance that it's made of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. fascinating though. I mean, yeah. I have a nice to catch a skull as well, and I was convinced for ages it wasn't. Um, yeah. <laughs> the beads should be orange, but uh, yeah, unfortunately. Um, so we've got a practical question uh, that I think has been answered now, but just for those people who can't see the chat. So are you able to send out a copy of the presentation to keep as reference when trying to identify birds in the future? So Susanna's answered that yes, we, we share a link to the recording uh, to everyone who's attended afterwards. Um, and until they go viral, they're put on the YouTube channel as well. Um, so people can access them. Um, but actually, at the end of the presentation, you've said, well, you know, go to the website because there's quite a lot of practical ID tips on there as well. Yeah, definitely. And then yeah. another thing that I'd like to do uh, soon when we're not quite um, as rushed off our feet is um, to create a flow chart, basically, that you can say, well, what colour beak does it has and then have and then sort of work down the flow chart to see what you're looking at. I think that would be a helpful way. So um, once yeah. I've made that, um, that'll be on the same the same website where you get the birds that they leaflet from. Great. Uh, so this is a comment um, from from Lynn. Um, so she says it's it's great to learn the ID clues to look for. I'm a very beginner and once in a while bird watcher. Uh, she says she's been watching some of the Georgia Audubon talks on Facebook. I probably didn't pronounce that right. Um, and she says here we have to deal with light pollution and also window crashes. Um, so I don't know. Have you got anything? You know, are there are there issues? Obviously, when uh, you you mentioned about dogs and access on the bay and things. Um, but do, do we have much sort of bird strike coming into to houses and things? Is there anything there we can do? Um, well, most of these birds, uh, the wading birds on the shore, they tend to stick to the shore. So even when the tide's in, uh, they like to still be able to see the sea. Um, so you won't get them coming too near the houses. Um, I guess if you, I think I have heard stories of people having like lovely seaward facing uh, glass windows um, and they've had, you know, oyster catchers or things flying into it, but it's not. It's not a major issue and I think a lot of these birds live on you know places like Morecambe Bay where there's quite a lot of reflections anyway um, and they're sort of slightly more adapted to it than other things like uh, your thrushes and your, your blue tits which tend to fly into windows a little bit more. Yeah um, lots of love for the bird sounds um, so not really any questions um, but yeah I agree that the eider ducks do sound a bit like Frankie Howard. <laughs> going going ooh. Uh, so yeah um so this is a good one um the uh which birds do murmurations so you mentioned the not do um do, do any of the any of the others do murmurations amy so dunlin do as well um but quite often you'll get a mixed flock i think it's mainly not that do the big incredible aerial acrobatics um but Dunlin as well and you might get red shank in there as well um, it's interesting because it looks so beautiful to us but I can imagine that when they're doing their murmurations and they're trying to escape from a predator it's probably quite chaotic so um, I wouldn't be at all surprised if you got an odd oyster catcher um, or red shank swept up in the panic and somehow trying to do all these uh, this incredible ballet <laughs> when they don't know the moves so. and wh where would be a good place to see a murmuration of not on the um, bay is there anywhere in particular yeah so the best places i've been um so down on Morecambe seafront um just a bit further along at the sunny slopes breakwater i've seen incredible murmurations there and then also at half moon bay um your best time to go is high tide because that's when they're all sort of pushed up into sort of really busy roosts and then if a peregrine or something comes along then they'll start doing all these incredible um these incredible patterns so they're the two that I'd say, but I'm sure there's other places. Um, I think Potts Corner near the Shawfields Caravan site, they get pretty good ones there sometimes, so. Great, thank you. Um, and I know it's not exactly a murmuration, but I think some of my favorite ones I've seen have actually been lapwing. Oh, um, yeah. The way that they, it's not really, it's not technically a murmuration, is it? But they, they do the beautiful sort of yeah. acrobatics and yeah. with the black and the white coloration, it's really exactly. stunning. I didn't really cover that in this, but lapwing uh, do have the most unique wings out of the waders. They have really sort of blunt spade-like wings. So when they fly, they look like they're sort of out of control a little bit. Um, but it's very beautiful to see. Yeah, I agree. 
Um, so, um, yeah, uh, another, another question here from someone called Susanna. Um, I'm not quite exactly sure who that is. Um, uh, so, yeah, uh, are there any other top bird watching spots um, that you can think of, uh, in addition maybe to the ones you've mentioned already for the knot? Yeah, uh, so there's lots of nature reserves, South Walney and uh, Leighton Moss are the big ones. They're absolutely fantastic. Um, I'd say South Walney on a high tide is one of the best places to see them, see the overwintering birds. Um, sometimes even if they can't, you don't see them on the shore, there's lots of slightly, um, the oyster, oyster farm pools, they'll often be hanging around and hundreds of types of duck uh, around there. Um, but also uh, down, down by Fleetwood on the sandy beaches, you get um, lots of sandaling running around. Um, and yeah, just basically anywhere. But a lot of the time you do see them in slightly more urban places. So all along Morecambe Seafront is absolutely fantastic. And, um, and you, know, you can cross the road and get fish and chips and then come back and sit and eat your fish and chips and watch the murmurations. So if it's not too great. Right. Um, so yeah, we've had a couple of comments here. Um, uh, I've, I've seen lapwings doing lovely displays in pilling. Um, we, uh, somebody saw uh, a not murmuration at Condor Green. Mm -hmm. I, I, d I don't know where Condor Green is. Where's Condor Green? Down by Lancaster, I think. Right. It's sort of where the, I can't remember which river it goes in a little bit. Yeah. Um, somebody else saying, what about Millam? So I, I do know that um, the Dudden Estuary can be good, can't it? Yeah, so the nestry is fantastic for oyster catchers especially, but um, yeah, around um, Hodbarrow Nature Reserve, um, the sort of the old um, iron ore mine, yeah. as well, like yeah. freshwater pool, so in there you get a lot of different ducks, and then on the other side of the sea wall, on the seafront, you get loads and loads of waders, but it's technically not Morecambe Bay, so... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, a couple of comments just around particular tips you've given. So the tip on the leg length of the godwits is brilliant. And then another one, yeah, found just saying how useful the feeding behaviour part was, um, which I would definitely agree with. Um, another one here, you, you, you haven't mentioned avocets um, and asking if we do get them. And I know we do get them because I've seen them. So um, is there anything else you can add about avocets maybe for, for people yeah. who have heard about them but never seen them? Yeah, so avocets we mainly get in the summer. So they come to Leighton Moss and also Condor Green um, to breed. So we get a few of them and they're really beautiful. Um, as you might recognise them from the RSPB logo. Um, that's how impressive they are. Um, but yeah, avocets we do get, but mostly in the yeah. summer time rather than the winter time. Yeah. I've seen them at the Morecambe and Allen Hides at Leighton Moss, so on the yeah. seaward side of the road, just by the level crossing. Yeah, yeah. Um, can can be again. a good place. Yeah, but then again, they have a completely different feeding um, technique. They do more sort of sieving from side to side. Mm. Um, so that's a good, um, if you, I don't know if you wanted to see me do an impression of our set, but you got it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so couple couple of people here have suspiciously got other meetings to go to at eight o'clock so i don't yeah. know whether whether meeting is a euphemism for great british bake-off because i know we're 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 um, we're clashing <laughs> aren't we in people's schedules uh totally so yeah um that was bill shannon anyway um <laughs> so i shall have words with him later um right i think probably the final topic here we've got is about binoculars okay um so yeah, uh, thanks for the presentation, Amy. I wondered if, if, if you or anyone else could recommend a good place to start with affordable binoculars. Uh, Opticron are really good uh, in terms of sort of quality versus expense. Um, I've got a pair of Kawa binoculars. Um, they're actually uh, sort of teenage sized, uh, but they're really light for when you're out, out and about walking around a lot and they're about £100. So you can get a decent pair for sort of between... 100 and 150 pounds and as long as you look after them they should last a long time so and is it is it something that you would recommend people buying off the internet or actually is it one of those things that is better to have a go with what you're going to buy um, first it, it depends um if you if you struggle with your eyesight a little bit then there's lots of places you can go to get some advice um i know well, I don't know if the shop at Leighton Moss is open anymore, but RSPB reserves do have lots of optics that you can buy. Um, try and 
before you buy and um but yeah if you get them online i guess if they don't work for you you can always send them back so yeah okay and i i, I have to i missed what you, i heard opticron you said another brand which was your own personal ones i didn't quite uh, catch so kawa k-o-w-a k-o-w-a right okay thank you well i hope that i hope that helps apparently leighton moss shop is just open again Okay, there you go. Comment here. So thank you, Kirsty, for, for posting that. Um, okay, so I think that is it on the uh, the chat. I don't know if anybody um, wants to come off mute and ask a question of Amy while well, we've got her. Um, what I normally do is I try and look out for ticks and signs of people putting their hands up or scratching their head and things like that uh, to see whether anyone wants to ask a question. So I'll have a little look. And I'll give it give it a couple of minutes, um, but feel free to take yourself off mute and just ask. Could you tell us how large the egret population is across the bay? Um, I'm not sure off the top of my head exactly the numbers, but I do know that it's increasing. Um, egrets are doing really, really well. It's one of the nice success stories of um, conservation, which seem to be too few of at the moment. Um, but yeah, they've gone from being a super rare site in the UK to something that we commonly see um, all around. So, yeah, mm. we're doing really well. And is, is that a climate change related thing, Amy? Um, or, or do we not know? Sure. Um, I know the sort of the population really crashed because they were hunted for their feathers. Um, so whether it's just a, a gradual recovery, um, I'm not sure, could be climate related. Yeah. Okay, good question. Yeah, they're lovely, lovely to see, particularly at dusk, aren't they? when they're flying to their roosts. Um, right, who else have we got? Um, anyone else want to ask a question while Amy's here? Could, could we have signs up along the seafront about not letting the dogs chase the birds? I don't think a lot of people realise the damage that it does do. <laughs> No, I don't think, I think that's the main problem. People don't realise that, you know, these birds are really adversely affected from um, disturbance. Um, we do have some signs up, uh, mainly around the Lancashire, Lancashire side of the bay, and we're working on getting funding to get some more. Um, but we also have natural ambassador volunteers who go out and just interact with people, like have conversations and show them the birds through telescopes. Um, and that's how we're trying to raise awareness at the moment. But um, it's going to be a um a long battle but hopefully we'll be able to get some funding and get some more signs up because i think mm. it's a great way but if you do want to see some of our signs they're very beautiful um we've got uh, seven along the lancashire coast so um you can on our website you can see where exactly they are but there's one at pillin um half moon bay uh wharton I'm trying to think what else there quickly pot's corner shawfield caravan site um yeah there's a few of them mm. But we do need to watch. Completely agree. Have you got something that we could share on social media, like um, a poster type thing or a statement that we could share everywhere? Yeah, that's a good idea. Um, I'll put together some posts um, over the coming season. And if yes. you want to share them, then that would be fantastic. But. Yeah. And obviously, we're, we're coming into the season now, aren't we, as well? So it's yeah, perfect, perfect timing for the winter, overwintering ones. Yeah, that'd be fantastic. Yeah. Um, and I know that uh, we, we're kind of waiting to, to put in a bid, but there are some uh, fundraising applications that Morecambe Bay Partnership are working on at the moment, which is looking at clever ways of trying to prevent recreational disturbance of some of the shorelines around Morecambe Bay. So um, through the, the Green Recovery Fund. So fingers crossed that we, we get that application in and then, uh, and then get the money because that will really help, I think. Um, great, okay. Um, I'll just have a quick look. Um, so Karen has just said, there were 55 little egrets at Leighton Moss two days ago. Wow. Fantastic. So that, that is a good number. Yeah. Right, okay. Well, I'll just have one final look. And then Amy, if no one has any more questions, we will thank you enormously for another brilliant talk um and then we will let people go okay good well uh, yeah amy that was that was really excellent you can see from the number of, of of comments 
um, some brilliant little tips there, which, as I said at the beginning, you just don't get from from books or um, or, or posters or anything. So it was it was absolutely fantastic. Really well pitched, I think, in terms of the level for for the audience. So thank you very much. Um, I will just do a, a, a very very brief um, advert for the next one of these talks. So keeping it varied, and um, then the next one is. Uh, Michelle, who's our, our team leader um, for, for the various project officers at Morecambe Bay Partnership, is doing a presentation on voices from the Bay. So that's around some of the oral history work that Morecambe Bay Partnership has done, capturing um, various of the industries, but a lot of it is around the fishing, fishing industry. Um, and that is in two weeks' time. So 13th of October, um, which I think, yeah, which is a Tuesday again at seven o'clock. So we hope to see lot of you there and um yeah keep your eyes peeled for further talks as well it's great to have you all joining us and such a, a high level of interaction and enthusiasm so it's brilliant to see you all thank you very much thank you.